The generations of our family before now have given you all and me the opportunities to be successful human beings. The opportunities we all have came at a price. The price paid by the initial immigrants who came to this country from Europe and the Middle East have provided us with the opportunities we have today. Don't ever forget the debt we owe those generations before us and the country that gave you birth and freedom. Remember your ancestors, they gave up all their tomorrows for you to have your today. This is Brian Brennan with the Lost in the Midlands podcast brought to you by Midlands Dumpster Services and C. Wright Roofing. And today is a privilege to be here with a, a very special guest, a, a patriot, a West Point graduate, a family man, uh, a man who has much to, um, to discuss and, and to teach us with all the life lessons he has. And he's, he's written this amazing memoir, General John M. Lenti. Thanks for being here. Thank you. <laughs> I'm excited to, uh, to dive into your past and discuss some of the experiences of your life and some of the things you've been working on even recently. Yeah. Um, yeah. But before we talk about some of the cool stuff at Celebrate Freedom and, the, and those projects, I do want to discuss a little bit about your family because it's it is interesting how you're you are this you're an amazing patriot. You've done a lot for this country, but your father was an immigrant from Italy. Is that correct? Yeah. And, um, and, and that somehow that, that bled into your, you know, decisions moving forward. So can you tell me a little bit about, about him and how that influenced some of your, um, yes, uh, from a historical standpoint, uh, it's kind of interesting now because we're talking about the border and, but in, uh, when my father came to the United States, he was on one of the last boats, wow. ships, uh, that uh, came out of Southern Europe. Uh, Congress in 1923, 22, 23, cut off all immigration from Southern Europe. Oh, wow. That includes Spain, parts of France, all of Greece, all of Italy. So he was one of the f few who got, uh, uh, got here under that uh, prohibition. So when he arrived, he was uh, 23 years old, um, without, uh, could not speak the language, wow. I had a, a third grade uh, education, uh, uh, was a, uh, it was a difficult time for him. Yeah. And I could never find, you know, I always wondered, because uh, uh, I went to Ellis Island, where you were thought that uh, all immigrants came and uh, and I couldn't find him. So I said, maybe he jumped ship or, you know, or whatever. But what I found out from a historical standpoint, uh, Philadelphia, where all the stadiums are now, that used to be the Philadelphia Navy Yard. Oh, wow. And that used to be uh, a, a, an additional entry point for the immigrants. Uh, and that's where he came in, into Philadelphia. Uh, so he... Um, Married my mother ten years later. Now my mother was had a different uh, background, you know. Uh, uh, so it, uh, he uh, he he had a tough life. He had a tough life, and uh, I didn't realize that till uh, you know till you get to the point where you can uh, recognize what uh, a tough life is. I mentioned in there one of his. Uh, little mantras is that uh, life is not supposed to be uh, easy. It's the Via Crucis, which is uh, the way of the cross. And uh, it takes you a while, you know, even when I was in my 20s, I never realized it, you know. So you have your own family, then you, you realize what it, uh, what it takes. Well, um, I understand that coming up, your brother, you know, fought in World War II, as yeah. did your uncle as well. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, how those experiences impacted you, kind of their, their brief story on them? Yeah. Um, uh, my brother was, 
born, uh, he was the half brother. He was born in Italy, so he spoke fluent Italian. I would have thought he'd uh, gone to the European Theater of Operations, but uh, he felt that uh, it would be too emotional for him to go back, uh, you know, and it would have been, uh, it would have been because uh, he was born in the very, almost the very tip of the boot of Italy, which is where the invasion of Italy started. So it could have been a, a difficult time for him. So he went into the he went to the Pacific. Yeah. Okay. Now my uh, uh, my uncle uh, was a um, was in the Aleutians, uh, you know, and got very sick there from the, and had to be uh, evacuated. Um, wow. But as, as again historically. That was one of the few, the only place that the Japanese at that time had invaded the Aleutian Islands uh, after Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> so uh, both of them, so I, uh, I sort of had a, um, uh, particularly with my brother who came back from Japan, brought back a, a rifle, you know, and as a young boy, I would fool around with it, you know, and. Uh, but I always had a sort of a leaning towards uh, being in being in the military, never thinking that I would be a professional soldier. Though that was not, uh, and as I said in the in my my notes, I didn't go to West Point to be a soldier. I went to West Point for three reasons: to <laughs> to play football, okay, <laughs> to to get an education. Yeah. And to find a good-looking woman, there you go. I got uh, I got two out of three, you know, which wasn't uh, uh, not bad. I'll take a, I'll take sixty-six and two-thirds any time. Good but uh, the football was over uh, very quickly, uh, in in a sense that um, during one of the initial plea, which was a freshman plea practices. Uh, I incurred a concussion. Well, that was the end of my football career. So, yeah. Uh, but it turned out to be uh, interesting. I gave uh, my doctor, who I've known for 40 years, uh, who is the head of oncology at uh, um, Lexington Medical, Dr. Steve Madden. Uh, uh, I've, I've known him since he was a contract physician at Fort Jackson in the, some 40 years ago. And, uh, he wanted my notes, he got my notes, and he got a big kick out of the fact that I had told him uh, the, uh, had I not got the concussion, I'd have been thrown out of West Point. Because uh, uh, academically, I was, you know, I, I didn't, I couldn't chew gum and spit at the same time. I <laughs> unfortunately were, was too young to f figure that out until like, somebody broke my skull open. So that's... Uh, so becoming a professional soldier was didn't happen until much later. Much later. Th that is interesting. Um, so, what was what was your move after West Point? Well, um, after West Point, uh, I graduated. Uh, well, I found I got I said two out of three. I got my engineering degree, and I found uh, a good looking woman. So that was my. Uh, but I think I gotta go back because, uh, you know, how did I come up with this uh, uh, in high school? Okay. I had a uh, uh, one of my uh, classmates who played football with me. His father was a doctor, and uh, he went to uh, Columbia University at that time. We're talking about the mid fifties. Uh, Columbia routinely played the Naval Academy uh, at uh, Bakerfield and uh, West Point uh, on their schedule. Well, I went to the, uh, his father would give us tickets and we, we'd go. So I went to the first one I went to was at Annapolis uh, game and uh, no big deal. Then the next year, I went to uh, the game up at West Point. Whoa, that was a, uh, that was an epiphany for me in terms of, uh, I couldn't. I couldn't believe it. All these attractive young ladies, you know. Uh, I said, "Hey, 
there's, there's got to be something to all of this, you know. So that was a kind of a motivating factor. And then when I got back home, a young lady who lived next door to me, uh, a beautiful girl, uh, one day I came out and I saw she was going, there she goes with a guy in from the Naval Academy. I said, well, that, that, that solved, that, that's the issue. How do I, how do I negotiate all of this? So that, that was one of the prime reasons I went to West Point, to be honest with you. I had no idea what duty on a country meant. I don't even think I could spell it, much less, uh, know what it meant, but not until, you know, you when I graduated, you know, and started working with soldiers, and uh, I had a um, my uh, background growing up in New York City. That's a real melting pot, and you know, we, uh, I I grew up with uh, uh, Irish, Italians, uh, Blacks, uh, Jews. Uh, you know, it was it was very uh, natural for me. To, to deal in those kinds of uh, uh, situations. So when I became a, uh, a lieutenant in the in the infantry, and had at that time it was the sort of the end of the draft. Yeah. And I had soldiers from from all of those walks of life, and uh, I loved them. They were they were just uh, uh, they were just great, uh, and. Uh, so the um, my first tour in Germany uh, wound up being a company commander, an infantry company commander. Let me ask you, sir. When you graduated West Point, were you commissioned at that time? Is that oh yeah, that's uh, when you graduate West Point, you get a degree in engineering, and you get a uh, you become a, an officer. Okay. Okay. You take the oath of office upon uh, graduation day. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that was, uh, that's all part of the, the, the program. Then you, uh, and then you get your first assignment. Mine happened to be Germany. Uh, and it worked out uh, uh, that uh, the, uh, I didn't have that good of an experience as a, a young lieutenant. You know, I was kind of, you know, it wasn't until I came back to the United States and joined Special Forces that, you know, I, I was with, uh, uh, you know, men uh, 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 who you knew had your back. Wow. You know, so that was, uh, uh, so that's what really propelled me. And all of a sudden I turned around, I got 10 years in the service, you know. <laughs> you know so you, it just winds up that way, Jeff. Yeah. This is Wright Brennan, the owner of Sea Wright Roofing. When it comes to the maintenance of your roof, you want to know that you have an experienced team that knows what they're doing. And with 10 years in the business, we check all the boxes. Leaky roof, storm damage, or just overdue on maintenance, give us a call at 803-828-4181 for a free estimate. Again, that's 803-828-4181. And remember, our commitment is to roof it the right way. Well, let me ask, so... It sounds like your, um, you know, family relationships, even women, is a big yeah, part. Yeah. You know, yeah. we can thank the women of this country for helping guide you. Oh West yeah, yeah and, absolutely. And then, um, you know, when you left Germany, had you you started a family at that point? Yes, I had two you know, two girls when I left Germany, uh, uh, Suzanne and Jacqueline, uh, and uh, you know, so I was fully married when I came back. You know, with two little. Two little girls. Yeah. So you you know the life of a military family. You know yes. the, the sacrifices that everybody's got to make. Yes. I guess. And, and it really uh, uh, the wife play. You can't. You got to believe uh, uh, the wife plays a dominant role in that. If uh, if she's not, uh, yeah, you know, if she can't take, uh, you know, whether it's a deployment or. Uh, uh, or the fact that you're in the field three, two or three weeks out of the year, and uh, you know you got a difficult road to help. And by the time that uh, I turned around, we had five sons and daughters. Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. And um, I, I want to kind of jump around a little bit. Yeah, sure. So 
you left Europe. You came back to North Carolina. Coming back, uh, yes, I got reassigned to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, uh, and uh, started uh, at that time. The special forces was beginning to to grow exponentially because of the war, and they started a new group, the Third Special Forces Group, and uh, we started in a uh, what uh, an area called Smoke Bomb Hill which had World War II barracks, you know, so you can imagine what they looked like in 1964. And, but, um, and that group still exists today and uh, uh, was a, uh, again, a, an epiphany for me in terms of the military. Yeah. It made a big difference to me. Uh, then uh, my problem with uh, Europe was, and I, and I look back and why, well, why was I, uh, why didn't I do as well as I thought I should have done? The problem at that time was there were there were a lot of uh, young officers getting out of the service, and unfortunately, a lot of them were in units. You know, and they, uh, you know, they never gave you the example you needed as a young as a young lieutenant. Yeah. You know, and. Uh, that sort of made me kind of jaundice towards a full career till I got to Fort Bragg. Wow. What happened at Fort Bragg? Well, at Fort Bragg, you, you know, uh, jumping out of aeroplanes, uh, having uh, non-commissioned officers who uh, uh, are the top of their, their skill sets, uh, joining uh, a... Um, this was the great... This was... Uh, uh, one of the interesting things I always think about is the beret, okay? Uh, at that time, the 82nd Airborne was there, and of course, they'd all uh, ha-ha wearing berets, you know. Now I turn around, 50 years later, everybody's got to have a beret now, you know? So, the you know, it comes full circle. Yeah. It comes full circle. So, um this was the time, it was a year after uh, Kennedy, when he came to Fort Bragg, saw my, uh, my uh, boss, who at that time was General Yarborough, with a beret on. He says, I like that. And that's how, he got the, that's how they, we got the Green Beret. But Kennedy said, I like that. You know? And so <laughs> there we had a... Imagine had that. A, yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Well, um... You spent time there, and then yeah, and then you, and from there you went to Vietnam. Uh, no, from there I went to the uh, infantry school at uh, Fort Benning. Uh, actually, after you graduate, you go to the basic infantry school uh, for six months. So I didn't really get to Europe until uh, I graduated in uh, June to give you a month off. Uh, then you uh, went to Fort Benning and uh, went through um, airborne school. Ranger School and a basic officer's course all finish up by December wow. of the uh, 1960. Came back uh, about this time of the year. Got married on the 31st of December and left for Germany the 15th of January. So, um, and that was, so that was prior to your deployment to Europe. Uh, yeah, that was for, all prior to my deployment to Europe. And and you mentioned you went to all these different schools. I, I know that yeah. I've, you know I'm not military, but I've yeah. heard that yeah. like Ranger School. It's a really tough program for. Um, yeah, it's it's it, it, well that yeah it uh, it uh, probably of all the schools except the Special Forces because when I went to Fort Bragg, uh, I had to. Uh, those, uh, the special forces program, orientation program, that's how you get your beret. You know, you have to go through the uh, an eight-week uh, program, the same as the uh, ranger school. Yeah. Both of those are fairly difficult. They're physically difficult physically and difficult. mentally difficult. Um, and actually, to be honest with you, uh, they're more difficult than combat, except in combat, somebody can kill you. Uh, where in this, uh, you know, but uh, in all honesty, uh, in uh, Ranger School, one of my classmates died in a river crossing, uh, slipped off the rope and drowned. Wow. So it, uh, they can be dangerous too. And jumping out of an airplane can, uh, can be dangerous too. It's a 
That's a thousand foot jump. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That sounds like this is a risky business being in the military is well, really what it comes down to. Yeah. And and then you I mean at some point you did go you you made your way to Vietnam and Yeah, right 64. after the right after the right after the uh the advanced course at Fort Benning. Okay. I uh, left in uh, June June of sixty seven for Vietnam. Okay. Okay. June of sixty seven. And and reading some of your notes, I understand you were part of the Tet Offensive, is that correct? Yeah, yes. Um uh, that was probably the, from an emotional standpoint, the most uh, difficult because uh, my uh, my operational unit uh, headquarters was in uh, Thompson Air Force Base in Saigon, uh, and and you got you know Saigon during that period of time uh, started out when the French were there about five hundred thousand people. By the time the war started, there were over two million people there. Yeah. So it was, uh, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it, it looked like, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking back now uh, uh, what was going on there. It looks like uh, what's going on in the southern border right now. Thousands of people, uh, the homeless, uh, yeah. you know, you could, uh, you know, uh, and, and then it's unfortunate because Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City now, Saigon was to be the Paris of the Far East, you know. Turned out that not not the case. So um, we, I had come in from the field after two weeks being out uh, up in. We used to normally uh, the unit I was with was a um, a strategic force that uh, got committed only to uh, uh, an active combat operation. In other words, some. And normally, for example, a special forces camp would be being overrun, and we would uh, they would uh, he helicopter us into that to to try to save that. Uh, and so it was always always helicoptered in or or went to a hot situation. Well, in the uh, in the case of um, uh, Tet, we come back to re to refit, and unfortunately. Uh, in our, um, they called it a villa, uh, where we where we lived. But the uh, uh, the uh, a red roof end is a hell thing compared to what the, what we lived in, you know. But you know that was it was a clean bed, and, you know, and you had a shower, and that's all we needed when we came back. Got a phone call about uh, two o'clock in the morning on January the twenty eighth, nineteen sixty eight. They said, uh, Dai Wei, which is uh, Vietnamese for captain. They said, Dai Wei, you better come. Uh, we've got trouble. I said, fine. So we jumped in on Jeep. You know, but there were six of us. We got in a Jeep and we started driving through Saigon. Now, I just finished telling you, Saigon, two million people. There wasn't a soul on the street. <laughs> there wasn't a soul on the street. Something and going on. You know, something was going on. So we made it through the town, out to Thompson. It's about a 20-minute drive, thinking that, you know, we're going to get ambushed one way or the other here. Luckily, we we made it through. Yeah. But subsequently, after the Tet Offensive, we went back on that route, and um, I um, we found a Jeep with uh, two contractors. There were CIA contractors. It was called Pacific Architects. Two of them were in a Jeep. Both of them got killed. Uh, the Jeep uh, was in pretty good shape. Uh, the windshield was shot out. Battery uh, compartment, which was right to the side of the driver, needed to be replaced. So we, we took the, uh, uh, the dead uh, contractors out, put them on the side, and we hauled the Jeep away, uh, you know, that was a piece of free, uh, uh, you know, transportation. You yeah. Know? Uh, and um, I, took, uh, I took it to a uh, third echelon maintenance. The Army's got uh, five levels of maintenance. 
first and second level of maintenance you do by uh, with your uh, your driver or whatever. Third echelon is short of being a rebuild, and fourth and fifth echelon they go back to the factory or whatever for rebuild. Yeah. So they got third echelon shop. I took the uh, Jeep in, and for an AK-47, you know, uh, he said, I'll do that, I'll fix it up for you. <laughs> so that was, uh, that's how I got a Jeep, and, uh, you know, they make a lot of stories up because I, when I was ready to leave, I had to auction the Jeep off, you know, so... <laughs> we, so. Well, um... You know, you had a lot of combat experiences, it sounds like, or, or some yeah, combat Yeah, Ted, see, Ted was a, uh, uh, the, fir the first couple of days, uh, most people who, uh, you know, anything about the, uh, the Ted operation, the NVA and the, uh, the Viet Cong uh, were decimated uh, there. Now, the, uh, the NVA were true soldiers, all right? I mean, I have to give them that credit. The the uh, the Viet Cong, uh, I would think of like they were kind of thugs, you know. They weren't really, you know. Uh, uh, so you had to you had to distinguish between them. Now the NVA, good soldiers. I mean, when you know when when you take a look at uh, them coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail with a pair of sandals, carrying a 150 pound load on their back. Walking, you know, they they had uh, they were motivated, so they were they were good soldiers, uh, comparably speaking. Um, in uh, Saigon, the uh, the NVA had never gotten there; it was mostly from the Viet Cong, and um, they were they were decimated. They broke through the uh, fences uh, at uh, at Tonsonut. Uh, and then by the, the end of the first day, we had uh, corralled them. We, the, the, the military police, uh, American military police, and um, an airborne battalion I had, corralled them to the center of, the, of uh, Tonsonut, and uh, the, that was the end, of, uh, the end of them. But it was a touch and go, and... Uh, uh, the ones who were uh, very, uh, um, who, who took a, you know, who were very uh, afraid were the nurses, you know, because the, the first field hospital, you know, which was, a, which is a major hospital in the army, uh, uh, was there and had a lot of nurses, you know, who obviously were very worried and uh, it took us a while to calm them down, yeah. you know, but... Uh, 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 they, there was never a uh, there was never a chance uh, of anything happening in Saigon. And by the end of the first day, uh, uh, a uh, an American uh, battalion had come through, and it was uh, you know nothing uh, nothing more. But it was three tough days. Yeah, three tough days. Well, in, in your um, in your memoirs here, your notes, you were speaking about when you were leaving Vietnam. Yeah. And you, uh, I want to quote you, you said, uh, I recognize the importance of leadership in combat operations. Poor leadership almost always gets soldiers killed. I also learned the main tenet of leadership was action, not words. And I want to ask you a couple of questions because, you know, yeah. shortly after that, you also kind of spoke about how the Vietnamese had a great leadership structure and they mm -hmm. were good mm -hmm. soldiers and that and that made the, a huge difference um was that something that kind of developed over time while you guys were over there the, the leadership did you feel got better now the the uh, the basic leadership that the vietnamese had uh came from the french foreign legion which had uh, stationed in saigon their airborne battalions and most of the uh, the officers in uh, the Vietnamese army, at least that I ran into, uh, were uh, NCOs in the French Foreign Legion. So they were, uh, and, you know, fairly good soldiers. I mean, I really didn't, uh, you know, I was, uh, I really didn't 
provide too much to them because they had, uh, in fact, I learned from them more than they learned from me. Now, what I could bring them that they couldn't get was air power and artillery. Yeah. You see, which uh, was basically a, an American uh, operation. Uh, so uh, that's where our uh, efforts came. Well, and let me ask you about the American leadership. Do you feel yeah. like the American leadership got better over time in Vietnam? Or uh, uh, it's t- it, it's it's tough to say now. Most of the lieutenants were ninety ninety day wonders. You know, I had to put it that way. You know, they didn't give them much background. You know, you don't get much. You know, don't uh, don't forget at West Point, I spent four years yeah. learning. Uh, you know, be and my uh, you know, and war is a, is a horrible thing. You know, and my uh, my grand my grandsons and daughters. Well, Dad, well, Grandpa, why did you stay in the military? I said because uh, I had uh, another awakening when I took a group of the 82nd Airborne. Uh, who landed in, uh, who parachuted into Normandy in 1944 for their 50th anniversary in Normandy. And I was at the the American Cemetery at Normandy. And uh, cross after cross, and when you read in there, there wasn't anybody over 21, 22 years old. All these young men had... uh, who uh, died, you know, 2,000 on the beaches just getting off the uh, landing craft. Uh, it just came to me that I, ha- I could save a lot of those people because of my training, okay? And I felt that I owed that uh, to the country. Uh, uh, they trained me for four years. Yeah. Yeah. They trained me for four years in the best military school in the world. So uh, that was my motivation. <laughs> <laughs> you have a, a solid leadership foundation yeah. that was built and everybody needed you. Well, basically. that's right. It, um, and at West Point, that's how you start. You start as a plea yeah. and you work your way up through merit. Well, let me ask you this. Um, do you think, do you see some parallels in, you know, like military leadership and then the combat environment you were in, then you came back and, I mean, th- were you able to also deploy some of the same skills and not quite a, such a terrible environment and kind of see success and the other oh, uh, things yeah, going yes. on? Yes, and uh, I mentioned, I think, in my notes, uh, General Schwarzkopf's uh, comment about leadership, and, and he's absolutely right, you know. Your soldiers depend on you uh, to keep them alive. That's your whole job. Uh, and so it, I made a, um, in my own mind that uh, I wanted to save as many of them as I could. After seeing Normandy and the cemetery of Normandy cross after cross, it, uh, it just uh, it had an indelible um, mark on me that... Uh, uh, that I felt that uh, could be a, could be applied anywhere. It didn't have to yeah. be in combat. Combat is the uh, the quintessential uh, time you, you use it. I mean, yeah. you got to have it then. Now, uh, there's a lot of times that uh, uh, you, you've got to. Uh, uh, I got. I think I uh, I mentioned in my notes uh, saving Private Ryan. Right. I had a young man. Uh, from New York named Joe Ryan. Joe was, uh, couldn't have been much, he was not much older than I was. He was one of my privates, got, got himself in trouble. And uh, to this day, uh, I, uh, you got to know, you, you got to know your soldiers. You know, he thought he was going to wind up in Leavenworth and I, I wound up giving him uh, company uh, punishment, you know, and he never forgot that. And 40 years later, he contacts the Association of Graduates to look me up and to thank me for not sending him to jail, you know. Uh, 
but that's what you know you have to make that choice and i mean i somebody else in my position as a company commander may have sent him to Littleworth. yeah okay but i knew enough of you know i i knew enough about human nature to recognize that you know that that wouldn't have been, that shouldn't have been the case for him so that's that's just one example where you learn you don't have to be in combat but but also growing up in new york with the the uh the different nationalities and people i dealt with just put me in, i mean i could deal with a janitor or i could deal with a general didn't make any difference to me that's a real talent. Yeah, that, that that's is, right. That is, that's th- right. That's awesome. I um, I wanted to hit on another theme that was in your notes. Yes. Um, the uh, kind of your spiritual life. I noticed you left some notes to your uh, yeah. your kids about you know, hey, you want to think about this too. <laughs> There's yeah. other elements to the world. Yeah. Uh, I had uh, I had two uh, I think extraordinary uh, situations when I was in. Uh, uh, in Vietnam, one in a, a, a very serious combat operation, and you know, and you see it in the movies all the time. And by the way, the, mo- the military movies, maybe with some exception with Private Ryan, uh, Saving Private Ryan, most of them are um, fictional. Okay, I yeah. mean, in terms of the real life, but uh, it's always when you know when it comes time when you're. There's no atheist in a foxhole, and if it looks like it's the end, Lord, save me, and I'll be a good man, blah, blah. It didn't come to me that. I mean, I was in that kind of a situation, but at that time I had four sons and daughters and a wife, and I said, and I thought about uh, (laughs) um, Solomon in the Bible, and uh, uh, apparently uh, God was so enamored with the Solomon because of what he uh, of what he did he said uh, I'll give you anything you want you want the riches and Solomon said Lord just give me wisdom and so uh, I said uh, I said to myself I don't need wisdom Lord but I want you to take care of my sons and daughters and my wife uh, and I don't care about me now, I thought that uh, looking back on it, if I said, Lord, you know, I'll be good, etc., I'd probably have been come back feet first. I thought that was a, uh, you know, something that I would have uh, never thought about until it happened, you know. And then the second one was I was in Saigon, and we used to uh, leave our, our, our quarters and I'd had a jeep with a driver, and there were three different ways of getting to my base, and we'd take a different route every time to avoid uh, an incident. Well, this one time, as I was pulling out, uh, a man, a a palsy uh, man with palsy, comes up to the jeep uh, looking for food, and I gave him food, and I looked into his eyes. And I couldn't believe, and I still see him today. They, the, uh, his eyes were, uh, were piercing, you know. Uh, and I gave him, you know, some sea rations that I had. Never saw him again. Never saw him again, you know. And I would have thought that, you know, most of the time, you know, it's like a, a cat, you know. You feed him once, you got that cat till he drops dead, you know. And the same thing with the, most of the people. You know, if you feed them, they're going to come back. Never saw them again. You know, those were, so I, I, related that, I related that to my, uh, my grandchildren, 19 of them, by the way, <laughs> uh, that, uh, you know, you got sometimes you never know when you visit, <laughs> you're visited by uh, an angel. <laughs> And, and I'm sure that all 19 of those grandkids are, are getting so much from these awesome notes, powerful stories, um, really an, an amazing life that you've had. So yeah, we're, yeah. we are fortunate we get to hear about the lessons you've learned. And I just want to say appreciate your service, appreciate talking thank you, to thank me. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Yes, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I'm hoping that they got something out of that. Absolutely. Hey, thanks for coming on today. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you.
Hey everyone, many thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, give us a follow and click the bell to stay up to date on future episodes or click the link to watch another previous episode. Also, don't forget to like, share, and please leave us a comment. We'd love to hear your feedback.